Hello again. This is Rich Troxler, aka Rich Trox, and welcome to another edition of my Reading the Beach videos. When it comes to catching fish consistently, being able to read water and beach structure is a valuable asset. I've put out several videos on the subject already, and once you've developed your water reading skills, you'll never look at water the same way again. In this video, I'm going to do something a little different. I frequently get asked, what's the point of reading water? Why not just tell me where the fish are? I addressed this on my previous companion video by saying that it's your job to know your local predatory species habits and the baits they feed on. While I believe this to be true, upon giving it some thought, it comes across much like a Microsoft support answer. That being technically correct, but fairly useless. So I decided to make this video and show you how, when, and where I would fish the structures from Practice Makes Perfect 1 for the species I fished for on both Long Island and now currently in Virginia Beach. This area by default covers from Long Island to the coastal islands of South Carolina. Before I go any further, let me get the disclaimer out of the way. The information provided on this video is based exclusively on my own experiences and should not be considered the be-all and end-all of fishing. It is intended solely to stimulate thought, provide direction, and encourage experimentation in the sincere hope that it may be of help to you on your surf fishing journey. End of disclaimer. I'm assuming that you have already watched the video Practice Makes Perfect 1 Strange Companions. And if you haven't, you should do so before watching this video so that you'll understand what I'm talking about structure-wise. Assuming that they are in season and around in catchable numbers, the species I will fish for is as follows. In the predatory class I put striped bass, red drum, which are the large ocean run fish, puppy drum, which are the smaller red drum, bluefish, and fluke and flounder, which are the northern and southern names for the same fish. There are other predatory species like black drum, trout, cobia, and various sharks, but these are typically incidental bycatch for me, and I don't actively fish for them. For bait eaters, there's assorted panfish like spot, croaker, and northern kingfish, what they call roundhead here in Virginia. There are a bunch of others that I don't fish for, and all are very good eating, but I generally only fish for spot for use as bait for large red drum in the fall. So now that the species list is set, let's move on. So let's go fish. This bird's eye view shows the layout of the whole structure. First stop is to the left of the T-bar, where the sandbar curves into shore, making the end of the sandbar roughly the shape of an L, or a warp C, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I know, it doesn't look like an L on the video or picture, but again, that's because of the distortion from the fisheye lens on the GoPro. This picture shows the sandbar, the trough, the farthest end of the sandbar where it hooks into the shore, aka the L or Warp C, and the opposite end of the sandbar at the point where it joins the central point, which is not readily visible in this picture. And I'll stick with the conditions as shown in the video, that being daytime, dead low tide, and a stiff onshore breeze. Not exactly great conditions for catching fish, but if that's the only time I had to fish, then this is how I would approach it, species by species. For this video, I'm going to bring back my old friend Cartoon Guy from some of my earlier videos, and he's going to be doing the fishing for me. He's a little out of proportion in size as compared to the person bending over for a shell in the picture, but who cares? He's in position and ready to go. Once again, the yellow line shows the sandbar, and the outer edge of the sandbar is where any fish will be. So my choice of starting point is where fish moving down the beach will run into the edge of the sandbar that has come ashore. I'll call this Zone A. This is a wedge point where predators can potentially corral bait fish and gain a feeding advantage. That's what edges are all about. So for red drum, I would be lobbing spot or mullet heads or chunks up against the sandbar edge. For striped bass, I would be lobbing bunker heads or chunks in the same place. With the surf the way it is, I might also opt to throw a bottle plug or fish a bucktail. For bluefish, I would throw tins and diamond jigs. 
For puppy drum, I would stick with lead heads and rubber tails. For fluke, a.k.a. flounder, I would fish bucktails tipped with gulp 4-inch white mullet over any edges I could find that had enough water. As for panfish, it's pretty much fish bites bloodworms for me. Spot loved them as well as almost every other panfish that swims the ocean front and bays, so I always keep them on hand. No special techniques are needed for panfish, just small hooks in a sinker. If there's water enough, there will be panfish aplenty, so I won't waste any more video time on them. From there, I would move toward the central point, and because I can cast conventional gear far enough to clear the bar, I would put a spot or mullet head or chunk right behind the first wave on the other side of the bar for red drum. I'll call this zone B. I wouldn't fish any of my other species this way, but I also wouldn't be surprised at a shark or bluefish either. After working my way down the bar toward the point, I would then set up at the junction of the sandbar and the point. I'll call this, you guessed it, Zone C. Again, this is another wedge point where predators can corral bait fish and gain a feeding advantage. I would fish this for the same species and in the same manner as Zone A, and the shallow water at the base of the point would allow me to wade out a little bit to get some extra distance on my casts. This picture is a snapshot slightly into the left to right pan from the original video. It shows the base of the point where the sandbar joins it in a little better perspective. You can see how shallow the water is there, so wading out some is possible even in these moderate wave conditions. Hey, looks like cartoon guy stuck a fish. Turns out it's a nice striped bass. Being able to read water and knowing where to place your bait, even under unfavorable conditions like these, can pay big dividends. Nice going, cartoon guy. Now back to the serious stuff. For these same conditions, I would fish the right side of the point exactly like a mirror image of the left side we just went through. Same zones, same species, same baits, etc. I will add that if the waves were smaller, as is common with an offshore wind, then I would wade farther out onto the sandbar at one end and the point at the other to extend the area I could cover with my casts. The only other difference would be my preference for which side of the point I would fish, and that would depend on the ocean sweep. If the sweep is left to right, then I would fish to the left side of the point. If the sweep is right to left, I would fish to the right side of the point. This is simply because bait fish tend to be pushed by current, and current over structure provides feeding advantages and opportunity for predators. This will be shown during the high tide cycle illustration coming up next. So let's see what changes when the tide comes in and the water gets deeper. First off, and pretty obvious, is I get pushed back off of the structures and more water covers them. That means that all species of fish, from bait fish on up, will now be crossing the bar and entering the trough. The second thing, and also pretty obvious, is that all the species of fish, from bait fish on up, are now going to relate to these structures completely different than they did at low tide. That means that I have to adjust my tactics if I want to catch them. The side of the point I decide to fish on is still dependent on the ocean sweep as previously explained, and I've decided to retire Cartoon Man in favor of simple X marks the spot on the illustration approach. Assuming the sweep is left to right, this is how I would proceed. Even though I can cast conventional gear a long distance, I seriously doubt I'm clearing that sandbar with bait and eight at high tide. So that's off the table right from the start. So for red drum, I would fish spot or mullet heads and chunks along the outer edge of the sandbar L and the inner edge of the point base with the sandbar L getting most of my attention. I'm sure some red drum will cross the sandbar and cruise the back edge of the trough, which will eventually bring them to the inner edge of the point base, which is why I would focus some of my efforts there. They may even do several circles inside the pond structure going from inside the L edge to along the back of the trough 
to the inside point edge and right along the shore lip back to where they started, chasing bait the whole way. This is something striped bass would do. To be honest, I only have nine years of fishing for red drum, so I don't have their habits down the same way I do for striped bass, a fish I have pursued for well over 40 years. But after nine years, I will say that they do have a lot of feeding habits in common with the striped bass, and much of my knowledge is transferable. For striped bass, I would fish bunker heads and chunks on the inner edge of the sandbar, backside of the trough, and inner edge of the point. If striped bass have found bait inside the sandbar and crossed into the pond, they'll more than likely find my chunk as long as I keep it near an edge. I would tend to start on the inner edge of the L because the current of the ocean sweep would be pushing water over that section of the bar into the trough, providing a feeding advantage for predators. Fishing plugs, I would go to my trusty Super Strike bottle plug in yellow-white for daytime and blue-white for nighttime if I felt larger bodied bait was in the area. I might also throw a Super Strike needlefish plug in the same color combinations as the bottle plugs if I felt long slender bait was present. Bucktails with pork rind or rubber curly tails and shad type baits round out the artificial selections I would throw under these conditions. For bluefish, well, they're bluefish. They'll eat anything, hit anything that moves, and show up just about anywhere at any time, particularly when you don't want them to. But you have to give them their due respect. The big ones will reduce a wood plug to a toothpick in no time, but they fight really hard and will make your arms hurt the next day. Puppy drum will eat small chunk baits off the ocean floor in just about any location, but it's more common for me to catch them while I'm fishing for flounder slash fluke, so I'll lump them together. For this type of fishing, I would fish only the inside edge of the L leg of the sandbar. This is because of the aforementioned sweep, which pushes water over the sandbar and into the trough. This sweeps any small bait over the sandbar with it. Flounder are ambush predators. They blend in with the bottom and lie in wait for an unsuspecting bait fish to be washed near it. Then it springs up out of the sand and eats it. Actually, they will follow bait for quite a while, and I have some very cool video footage of a flounder following my rig while I was doing some bay fishing. But anyway, in this situation, this is what they do. They line up on the drop side of the bar, so I would cast up current with a lead head or bucktail with a Berkeley Gulp Alive swimming 4 inch mullet in white and swim it over the sandbar and into the trough. I would cover the whole length of the sandbar with my casts and in addition to flounder I would not be surprised at all to catch a puppy drum also because they seem to favor the same conditions. So where are the fish? Where should you throw your bait? Hopefully this has given you a general idea of how I would fish this structure and provided you with a little insight into my thought processes. As I've said before, being able to read a beach can make all the difference between success and failure in surf fishing. It's one of the most important tools you can have in your toolbox. I'll be following this video with another beach reading video very soon. So stay tuned and remember, practice makes perfect. That's my view from the beach, so until next time, be well and catch him up.